Welcome to the Royale Express podcast, a place of music, travel, and the expansion of knowledge. Ooh. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Royale Express podcast. My name is Uno Sipom Kize, the founder, director, and host of the Royale Express podcast. Today we are joined by none other than um, Mr. Soto, Mr. Sibia, who is the founder and CEO of Ezuni Hospitality. With a number of uh, initiatives, uh, more specifically, we will talk about Life Lessons Development Institution and X Factored uh, Movement, which has a number of divisions. But um, I will not explain any more because I want uh, Ubaba Soto to have the most of his time on this podcast. So I will allow him to introduce himself, give his greetings, and uh, tell us more about who he is. Babusat Dobe, welcome. Thank you for being on the podcast. Um, how are you? Thank you for featuring us. <laughs> I'm well. How are you? Good, thank you. Good, thank you. So if we just jump straight into it, um, you have a great portfolio and uh, I don't feel like I have the honor to delve into it myself with my own power. So I would like you to please introduce yourself, tell us more about who are you and uh, the journey you've taken to be here. Who is Mr. Soto? Who am I? I'm trying to figure that out still. What little I know. Uh, I'm involved in a few things. Uh, topical for today is Ezweni Hospitality, which we'll talk about briefly. And I, my passion, uh, youth development. I'm not sure if it's passion for, sake, for the sake of passion or it's passion because of the necessity. Uh, I do think if there's one thing that is absolutely necessary today is putting in a lot of effort in youth development. I think if we are to stand a chance for our businesses to succeed, for our country to succeed, for a generation to thrive, we're going to have to put a lot more focus on youth development. So um, I will, we'll come back to that. Then I spend my other life in uh, human capital development, in human capital management. Um, through a company that I founded called Exploited Human Capital, where we do leadership development, we do um, con workplace conflict management, relationship building, um, build collaborative teams between employers and uh, labor formations and so on. Uh, so that's me and my involvement. Uh, it's probably very important that I say I'm a father of four two sons and two daughters. Uh, very, very important vocation in my life. I do commit a lot of my time in parenting. I do believe that it's one of those things that I must always put myself on some form of a performance management system about 10 C if I'm meeting my, KPI, <laughs> my KPIs as a father. I just think it's such an important thing. Uh, the implications of failing there are just too ghastly to, com to contemplate. Anyway. As in hospitality is what you want us to talk about. So, what do you want to know? <laughs> I want to know, um, as, 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 as much as Ezweli is, is the entry point of, of who you are, but I want to know who you are. Firstly, because we, for us to understand you as, um, if I may say, Mvana Futi Sibia, you are a son, yeah. you are a father, yeah. you are a founder. So let's start there. You're a son. Tell us about you as a son being your identity. Cool. Um, I'll give you snippets. It's not an area I go to very enthusiastically. Uh, I'll, I'll indulge for the purpose of this exercise. Uh, I'm born in the mid-70s. Um, uh, and, and maybe that's as far as, far as I want to take that date issue. Um, I, will, I will tell you this much. Uguti, my mother and I, Sishiana, were 21 years exactly. Uh, that should tell a long story. Uh, I will also tell you, Uguti, I use my mother's surname. Uh, that should also tell you a long story. And I'm introducing a number of stories, I'm sure you can tell that, in saying what I'm saying. Uh, I was brought up by my aunt and, uh, and, and her husband, uh, whom I dearly refer to as my mom and dad. Uh, the husband to my aunt Wagam Kize. So for many people, I grew up in Wagam Kize because I'm cool at Wagam Kize. I hardly ever make reference to my 
uh, father's surname. Uh, I wouldn't even tell you it's Tagazelo Sakona. That's how disconnected I am to that. Do you surname. know his surname? Absolutely. Uh, and that seen. story ends there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what else would be of interest around that? I'll also tell you this, Oguti. Uh, I, I am born in January on the 25th. Um, and uh, uh, and um, I, I come home, I'm told, um, to Imbatha, Zikokiwe, Zibegiwe, Gutu, because in terms of the laws of the time, if a home did not have a male who still worked, um, the family had to vacate corporation houses, municipal houses. Uh, Oko that had uh, uh, um, fostered my parents, uh, or my mom at least with her siblings, um, had, had been allocated to move uh, to a one-room house and she was to move there with these three kids that she has fostered and this baby newborn that had come. So uh, I, I'm born in circumstances of homelessness uh, in many senses and my biggest fear in life was remaining homeless such that my first attempt to get a home I would have been 18. Uh, and uh, so as a result, I think I collect homes <laughs> as a part-time hobby because I'm so scared that nobody should ever have, should ever, ever face a prospect of being homeless uh, in, 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 in my lineage. Uh, it had to stop with me. So as a son, maybe that's as far as I will go. I then grow up and give the Wamashu and Wamashu. Uh, I am always proud to say that I am matriculated in Nabagazulu, uh, in Nabagazulu, and in Nabagazulu. I am sure you will come across that name a few times, and it's often associated with things good. Uh, so, so yeah, I matriculated in Nabagazulu, and, and growing up, very serious. Uh, I don't remember smiling much. Um, I learned to smile for the first time. It's a story I share from time to time uh, of how I actually realized the impact of smiling when Bliss was born. Uh, I'll tell you the story. I'm pushing, I'm pushing a place, a, a pavilion in, in a pram. And, and I'm, ve I'm a very serious person. I'm very, very serious. Life just didn't give me opportunity to find things funny uh, too much. Um, so so I'm, I'm watching people as Pambana Nabo. I mean, come get serious, like, focused. Then they gaze at this prayer, and then the facial expression changes completely. So I'm, I'm wondering what could possibly be happening in this prayer. So I end up pulling, you know, this cover, your prayer. I end up pulling it and peeking with Gwenzagalan, and I see this boy gazing. He must have easily been about three, four months at the time. And he's just smiling at everybody and looking at them with his big eyes, and this is the reaction that they get. I mean, one person says, this is the cutest baby I've seen in Africa. And I see the friendliness, I mean, the transformation from a stern, serious face to a friendly face. Okay, so there's something in this smile. And for the first time, I actually considered smiling, you know. You would greet me. Mang hamba now we introduce, so ung introduce to a friend of yours. Uti me to food here, say, hi, gunjan. Because I just didn't understand the smiling thing. And, and here am I confronting the effect of a smile on strangers. So I had to go home and start practicing how to smile, you know, at a centimeter here, a centimeter here, is it coming out? Yeah, uh, to try and see if it's coming through. So I, I grew up very seriously, and I think as a generation we were like that. I think a generation of people, I started school in 1979, I finished school in 1990. Uh, most of the people I grew up with were, were, were scared, scared of poverty and trying to do everything that they can to set themselves a foundation where they are going to uh, escape uh, what seemed to be the looming threat of growing up and replicating what they had grown up with. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the era that informs how, how one grows up. Um, do you want one to one can, can, can tell a lot about you as a father 
just by having met your son, Uplis, first, um, the way he is, the way he speaks about you, the way his face lights up when he speaks about you, one can get a background understanding of who you are as a father and your, your inspiration for what you do and how you lead. So you, as a leader, as a father, I can assume and anyone can assume that you are proud and happy but I would like to still ask you and hear it from your own words. Are you happy and proud as a father? N now knowing your background, but now you, how you have become as a father to your children. As I said earlier, I think it's one of those areas where every father must put himself on some performance contract with himself and uh, put very clear KPIs and KPAs of what it is that you want to have influenced your kids about and monitor whether or not that influence is coming through. Are they becoming decent, contributing people who are confident in themselves, who, are, who would be able to survive without you? Um, in, in many respects, I think I've been extremely lucky, extremely blessed with uh, people, kids that seem to hear what I'm trying to achieve, uh, that seem to believe in the dream that I've sold them, uh, that are trying to put some effort into it. And uh, we've also been blessed with a lot of time to be able to spend time together and actually interact because I think a lot of it happens organically. You do not have to have set up a curriculum with you today. We are dealing with influence 101. We, today we are dealing with friendliness 102. Uh, it has to emerge as part of uh, the everyday experiences. And, and so your life. son, even through that inspiration, has written and published a book, Indeed. which is sitting behind you at this moment. Indeed. And uh, as he wrote a forward and acknowledgement to his father, how did you feel of when you read that, uh, that acknowledgement that he wrote about you in the first pages of his book? Luckily, luckily, he didn't say anything that in that forward in that in that book that he hadn't already said in person, so he, 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 it confirmed it. Uh, but my proud moment was when I was asked to write what do you call it? Uh, right in front in front of the book. What's that section? Right. Forward. That's the forward. Yeah, that's the forward. When I get asked to write a forward, and I thought, yeah, no, I mean. This is the best thing that could have ever happened to be asked to write a forward in your son's first book. And I'm saying first because um, I realized that there's many other books that are sitting in that, in that brain. So yeah, that was, that was very proud. Very, very much a proud moment, certainly. Awesome. Thank yeah. you very much. Not only a father to your son, but a father to a nation. Um, tell us about the x factor division, multiple <laughs> divisions that you have. Have they told you too? <laughs> they, I, they, I, they have I, told us. Um, I, I, I would just like to know um, a, a breakdown of it. Um, any other element that you would like to add uh, apart from what is already available on the website and material that is out there? I thought they've also told you I've been called Father Abraham. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, father of many sons. Um, look, I'll tell you a little story that probably is a precursor to, to Life Lessons Development Institute, which houses the expected uh, youth section of the work that we tried to do. Um, I told you I matriculated in Malagazulu, and we were this generation of kids first generation of kids that started going to what was referred to then as multiracial schools. And we realized very quickly that um, the command for the language is going to be a differentiator between those who are seen as potentially successful and those who aren't. And we started to organize ourselves into a group that we called E English Academy, uh, where we would meet twice a week, I think, after school as an extramural and we would put debates together, we would do symposia and those who were into writing poems would, would write their poems and do their reciting. And then out of that, we then get invited to the American Cultural Center for a, 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 a lecture on um, cultural sociolinguistics. Um, and, and as part of this, they decide that they are going to have us there much earlier in the day. The workshop was at 2 o'clock and we were to be there at 10. And they had prepared a series of things for the five of us who were 
um, in leaders of this English Academy thing. And among other things, they had prepared among self-development videos by Leo Buscaglia and, uh, and, and, and some of the conversations that were happening there, uh, some of the presentations that we were listening to had quite an impact. And had it not been for those presentations, I'm suspecting that the idea of the expected youth would not have come about. Um, and, and I realized that had it not been for that day, a lot of the things that I've dreamt about and done, I probably would not have done. And it then said to me, how many people grow up having never been asked what their purpose is in life? How many people grow up having never figured out what difference they are here to actually make? And uh, growing up, I've always then had an obligation that that which happened to me on that day in 1989 needs to happen. Everybody must come across a day like that where you're going to have a a conversation that's going to make you confront what your purpose is in life, what are your strengths, what are you able to do, where are opportunities to make a difference, where is the biggest challenge of life that you are a solution to. So life lessons development then gets founded in that context to say how, what, what vehicle can we use to engage youth about some of important life questions. So we establish Life Lessons Development Institute as an NPO, and we then run uh, self-development workshops for the youth. I then write a program at the time that we called um, Excellence, Pursuit for Excellence, Becoming a Person of Contribution and Purpose. And it evolves until we call it Expected 101, because we are talking about the excellence factor. Uh, where the excellence, the X factor is excellence, extraordinariness, uh, going the extra mile, being exceptional, um, so X factor. And then uh, it becomes X factor 101, which then says in this X factor 101 program, you're going to be dealing with questions of how to lead a life of contribution, life of purpose, how to be excellent at what you do, how to be extraordinary, how to achieve exceptionalism, how to um, do all the things that exceed expectations. So, hence, expect that one over. Now, and we, you also have a book called Expected Then we convert the program into a book. Right? We now have this as a workbook, Expect mm -hmm. 101 as a self-development -de program. It deals with such questions as who am I uh, as, as a self-concept issue, which we believe is foundational to any life. If I have a good sense of who I am, I'm then going to permit myself to do things that coincide with who I believe I am. And to the extent that I do not have belief in who I am, I will accept whatever I'm told I am. And, and I may not even challenge uh, my circumstances because often you find who I see myself as and what my circumstances are, there's a gulf in between. And to the extent that I see myself in more positive light than my immediate environment, I'm going to be energized to realize the person I believe I am. But if I don't have a sense of self, I will accept what my circumstances tell me I am. So we felt quite strongly that it was a good place to start to just ensure that everybody has a very strong sense of self a good sense, a positive self-concept as a starting point. And then the next conversation in the Expert 101 deals with purpose. Um, and where we're saying, you couldn't be here if it was not to fulfill some meaningful purpose. And we then go through a journey of trying to work out what that purpose might be for each person. And we suggest that answers to what my purpose is may lie in such things as what are my talents? what challenges confront my circumstances at the time because we will always be relevant for our circumstances. So we suggest a number of things that people could do to identify uh, what, their, what their purpose is. And then we move, it moves on to saying then, how do I prepare myself better to ensure that I'm able to fulfill my purpose? What knowledge do I need? What skills do I need to acquire? What networks do I need to build? What resources must I have? How do I better prepare myself so that I'm able to fulfill that purpose? And then we work out a life plan of execution now to that purpose so that by the time you get to the end of it, you, you're quite proud about how you have led your life. So that's, that's the framework of the Expert 101 as, as, as a program and as a self-development program. 
So as you talk about your circumstances and very thankful to the rain that comes to bless us at this moment, tell me right now where you are at this point in time, where what you have established with uh, the large and the many other movements that you have, as you mentioned, the X Factors and everything that you do with, um, under the, the Life Lessons Development Institution. What are your current circumstances? Because it's very clear that you are here because of the circumstances that you yourself come from and you've developed yourself to a place where you are no longer homeless and you are no longer fatherless and you are the father and founder of many movements. But the current circumstances that you have now created for yourself and that you now find yourself, what are you able to fulfill now and what are your next visions and goals um, that you pursue within the current settings that you are now in, that you've created and that you also find yourself in? Sure. It's quite an involved question. Um, let's look at what do I find to work and work well? Uh, and then, and then the, I'm probably going to be brief there. And then we look at what do I find not to work uh, or not to be working and uh, an area of challenge and, and, and further work. Um, in, in many ways, I get a lot of sense of satisfaction about um, where one has been able to get to um, in, 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 as, as a stage in life development. Um, I've, I've never been one that measures the success of any life through material accomplishments. Uh, I've always believed that we must be able to measure the success in our lives through the impact uh, and influence that we've been able to achieve. And, and I do believe that um, one has been able to grow um, a, a decent amount of uh, influence, uh, whether it is corporate influence around the area of uh, human capital development, uh, I'm, I'm quite happy that I've been able to establish a fairly uh, respectable reputation as a human capital development practitioner and professional. Um, and uh, I tend to measure the success of that, not so much by how much income one makes from it, but by what valuation feedback do I get from people who may have been involved with my coaching sessions on managing performance, for instance. Um, I always want to know, do you now feel that the organization has a better grip on performance management uh, as a result of having gone through the program than you had before? Or if it's people that we have taken through a program on creating a culture of discipline within an organization, and three months down the line, we'll be having a conversation. Do you feel that your organization is a better disciplined organization? Is it is an organization that depends less on disciplinary hearings and more on a conscience of discipline from among your workforce as a result of the intervention that we may have had. Where we've had uh, relationship building interventions between unions and management, it's always nice to go back and hear a feedback that says, you know, our relationship was in the doldrums until we had that two or three day session on relationship building. So insofar as how do I, what are my current circumstances? I, I, I am privileged to be in circumstances where I feel that I've established my area of influence and, and, and I feel that um, I have the opportunity to make a meaningful contribution in that space of influence. Uh, so that's one about what works. Family-wise, uh, I, I, I am able to sit sometimes and uh, look at this crowd that surrounds me and uh, people that are able to tell me things that no one else would be able to tell me um, uh, people that are able to cut me down to size and tell me all my shortcomings it's nice to have to have people that uh, have no qualms so I'm, I'm quite I'm quite I'm quite pleased we are a big family as I've indicated to you um, there are six of us at dinner table every evening uh, which is quite significant for a modern family um, for four kids is no mean achievement, and I say four kids so far. Uh, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> now we know. <laughs> right, and then and then it's a, there's a couple of things that obviously worry me, and 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 maybe that's where I prefer to spend a little bit more time. Um, there's there's a few things that absolutely worry me. Um, I I I sometimes feel that the conversation that we've been having. As, as a community of black people specifically um, has, has undermined what we would have otherwise been capable of. I move from a premise that says we are all capable of much more than we've been able to deliver so far. And we have not asked enough of each other. We have not held each other sufficiently accountable for our talents, for our gifts, for our ideas, for our thoughts. And we have not always expected the very best from our interactions with each other. So I, I almost feel that when I look, and, and I'm telling you what doesn't work, and I'm speaking completely honestly things that trouble me a lot of the times, uh, I don't watch TV. And on a, very okay, on a very rare occasion that I happen to watch TV, I start to ask myself, what must you believe about our society to put the kind of content that you are putting on TV? What must you believe about your audience to think that you'll entertain them by the kind of offering that is being given on television today as a form of entertainment? And to the conversations that are far more important and urgent, that should be part of a content, don't you have such a powerful instrument that reaches in everybody's lounge where you could start to make more topical conversations that are going to change the direction of our society? That worries me a hell of a great deal. I worry about the extent to which we have allowed miseducation to continue completely unabated, complete miseducation. I don't know if today we, had, we can afford the luxury of not having ethics as one of the core subjects at high school level. Ethics. Uh, just, just so that people will have a standard that is commonly shared across all society about what is ethical conduct. I don't know if we're spending enough time talking about such things as courtesy and manners. Um, the good old things that said first come first serve, the good old things that said um, I am human and uh, I need to behave in a manner that demonstrates that I'm better than animals. Um, so, so there's a lot of things that worry me. It worries me that if I'm walking um, down some street um, and, and this happened to me, uh, um, um, and, and, and it's a thought that worries me to this day. You know, you're walking a very small alley in the evening at dusk in a country that is not South Africa, in a country that is not in Africa. And there is three of you. And uh, there is a young lady that comes out of the building a, further, a few meters in front of you. And she looks back only once and then she looks straight ahead and walks as if it's nothing, without any sign of fear about who is walking behind her. And you start to say, if this was in my country back home in South Africa, in a narrow alley such as this, three men uh, and a young lady in front of them, she would, she would have been completely never wrecked. Uh, and, and uncomfortable about this idea. And the fact that we have not created a sense of security, a sense of safety, the fact that I'm not able to relax when I see someone else at night and feel that I'm safer because there's now someone else, but I feel even more threatened now that there is someone else, that worries me a hell of a great deal. So if you ask me where I am, I, I, I'm very anxious about where we are going because of those things, among other things, where I sometimes feel that you'd probably be safer in a, uh, animal sanctuary somewhere or even uh, than, than you are among your own people. Um, I'm, I'm speaking to you here living in a beggled up house with burglar guards, uh, with high walls, a fence, uh, armed response alarm system subscription. And it's not against animals, it's against people that I'm protecting myself. Yes. That worries me. I'm saying that brings us then to expected youth as a vehicle. When we established expected youth, our initial idea was that we are going to push workshopping self-development uh, program, which is expected 101. We very quickly realized that if you want to reach youth, you're going to have to reach them at a multiplicity of platforms and probably bringing them into a workshop for the sake of a workshop is not going to be the best instrument. So it started to make sense that 
um, start introducing art as a, 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 a pool. So we, in, we partnered with a group and we established something that we called Ink Your Art because we wanted to first impact in the ink area, which is in Andantuzuma and Guamash. Um, and with Ink Your Art, we were then able to assemble a number of youth who would be hip hop artists, aspiring, who would be poets, who would be um, fashion designers, who would be all sorts of things. And uh, once they are there, we then introduce them to the, to the concept of excellence and we start organizing workshops uh, and, and ensuring that it's integrated within, what we, within the art um, program that we have. We've also looked into expected sports where we were saying, come, let's play some sport. Uh, the first event a couple of years ago that we did that sports related is we organized a fun run um, around, a, it was a 10 kilometer run around Dumashu where you could take a five kilometer or take a, a 10 kilometer. And it was a family day outdoors. Um, and, 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 and we then arranged that we should have these conversations as part of the play. Um, if it is a, a, one of the games that we played on the day was the volleyball. And we always try to then create a, a conversation around that sporting activity. What is this about? It's about cooperation. It's about uh, collaborating. It's about watching what the other person is doing, backing up and ensuring that when the ball is coming over to you, we are, you, you are ready to fulfill your role. It is when each person fulfills their role that we are able to make sure that this game becomes a success. And then we extrapolate that to the game of life, that in order to be able to play this game of life in a more meaningful way, how do the same principles apply and so on. So we're using sport as a medium or a modality to start introducing those concepts. So we've tried that and we continue to do so. Then we also organize what we call expected forums. With expected forums, we will take a topical discussion. Uh, we will advertise, we will bring the right speaker to do it. If I can recall a few topics that we have had, uh, one September, we had a conversation that was saying, has a tradition, uh, it was something to do with tradition and modernity. Yeah, tradition has tradition collided with modernity? Uh, where the conversation was about, is it true that traditional is an opposite of modern? Uh, where the argument was saying, surely not. Uh, modern is not an antonym of tradition. Tradition can be as modern as modern ever gets. And, and it was quite an interesting conversation to have. Um, and, and, and it touched on a few things that, that, that were quite a, a, in, interesting. For, for instance, um, is there an expectation that if I'm going to be coming to a cultural lodge such as we are on here, I, I'm not going to be able to give you cutlery to, to use uh, a silverware because there's an expectation that um, that's, that's, that's not sufficiently traditional. But who's to say that tradition would is not modernizing, modernizing sufficient that there will be silverware in a traditional African home. So we deal with topics such as those. Uh, we will deal with uh, issues of, of so, so through expected forums, we will then introduce a topic, we'll have a speaker on that topic, and then, I mean, one of the most fascinating conversations we have had was a conversation that said, what freedom did we want? What freedom did we get? What have we done with that freedom? Um, and, and it started to trace back that our liberation movements in Africa, what was their agenda? What did they seek to achieve? We looked and we profiled uh, the African freedom le uh, struggle leaders and we said, what freedom did they want? And, and we started to judge them not only by the rhetoric that they said, but by what they did uh, when they did get the freedom. And, 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 and unfortunately, uh, as, as you might realize, uh, the, the results were not very encouraging if you look at what we did with that freedom. So we'll, do, to, do, we'll use expected forums to try and also influence. And the idea is, once you've come across this type of content, even if it's just one thought that's going to trigger something in you, you are transformed for life. So the idea is always those that we can keep for a little longer, we keep, but those that can only interact with our content once, we want to make sure that we've impacted, we've impacted on them. Then we run AMA leadership school uh, leadership schools 
Uh, we've done this as a winter school a few years, for a few successive years, where during June holidays we will have a Expector 101 leadership school um, for 10 days. Uh, it is here on site for this community here. And in other times we've done it as a, we a weekend conference uh, or, or workshop. And a few times we've also partnered with other organizations. Once we partnered with the uh, Department of Social Development at Tewini North region. Um, and then in terms of outreach, we one of the things that we've believed on very strongly is the education that people can derive from travel. One of the biggest disadvantages we find uh, is if you are living in a community where people don't travel, they tend to be fairly closed uh, the, um, in, in their mindset. So one of the things that we've tried to do is to take people on travel. We've taken twice a group of young people from here in South Africa, Durban, a few from Richards Bay in Zululand, and we drove through into Eswatini, picked up a few expected youth members from Eswatini, and we traveled over to Mozambique, picked up a few from Maputo, and then we went all the way up to Shai Shai for a weekend. And, and, and those youth that participated in, this, in that program can never be the same. Just from the experience of that weekend uh, session out in, in Shai Shai. So there's a number of things that one tries to do. We largely unsponsored, so we do what we are able to put together at that point in time. From time to time, we do get to have partners. We, we've also been lucky to be able to do a lot of work with a SOS Children Villages, Eswatini. Uh, we've been able to be part of Africa German Youth Initiative here in South Africa, which has allowed us access to many youth organizations where we've then been able to put our content. And uh, last year we were sponsored by a uh, German government, uh, what, Global? Engagement Global, uh, where we ran a expected youth workshop for, I think it was six or eight weeks, uh, all online. So it has been able to reach quite a number. The books were sponsored, distributed, uh, with the data was sponsored and distributed. We were able to run those online classes for about 120 youths. So we've had opportunities. Are they enough? No, I wish there were more. Good, awesome. I'm gonna let my friend come in. Uh, she's been picking up her hand. <laughs> and, uh, nudging me on the side desperate to come in with some questions so I'm not going to hold her any longer with any constipation please uh, Zama come on in my colleague Zama Kumalo uh, she has a lot to, to ask you at this yeah. point thank you so much Lucy I really do appreciate this and thank you so much Mr. Zimeo for your time um, as you just heard that my name is Zama Kumalo Skums. yes uh, founder of Itemu Connect um, a platform that basically profiles creatives and just looks at basically their journey and everything of that nature. And like I said once again, thank you so much for your time and your hospitality. It has really been amazing. So within the conversation that you've, you've had and within, you know, the things that you've said, one of the things that I want to know, especially as you as a black man, how did you ensure yourself to not be deterred from the journey that you are making, especially because of how the world views you as a black man. You know, because within the society that we live in, unfortunately, the black man is viewed as something that's a weakling, you know, and we've had many type of factors, one of them being racism, which puts down the black man um, within what he does or what he says and things of that nature. How were you able to not allow those type of elements to get into your life and sort of like destroy you from the journey that you were taking? Because it's very hard to sort of, you know, deal with the situations that are happening and sort of like internalize it and put out those conflicts towards, towards other people. So how were you able to just focus on your journey and create a greater tomorrow for those that are around you? I actually don't know if I have. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really don't know if I have been successful at that. Um, again, and, 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 and it's one of those areas of, 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 our of our daily conversation that I find most disturbing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have a huge problem with the generalization mm -hmm. of all men as one thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it seems to be the only area where society does not punish generalization and stereotyping. If I stereotyped 
certain protected populations, I'll be called out very quickly. But if I generalize and stereotype men, it's okay. It's actually politically correct. If I don't do it, uh, if, if I say not all of them, I've committed the worst crime. Mm. So it's not something I deal with very well mm. because I, I, I'm a father to two boys mm. as much as I'm a father to two girls. Mm. And, and I feel strongly that I would much rather be bringing them up in a society that validates their decency rather than the society that reminds them of how indecent they are. I would much rather they were celebrated for being good rather than being generalized as being bad because they also happen to be male. So it's not an area that I deal with very well. I'm not sure how much good we are achieving by criticizing and painting everyone with the same brush and, and not looking out for those that we can celebrate so that we can put them on the top of the highest and tallest tower and really praise them so that they become an example of how men should be. And that's not what we've been doing. So I'm not sure if I have, and I'm sure you can tell that I, it's, a, it's an area that I get rather, mm -hmm. uh, um, I get, I don't want to say emotional, but yeah. I feel quite strongly about Because if we were to bring, you know, I've been influenced more, not by my critics, mm -hmm. I've been influenced more by those who have shown some faith in me. Mm -hmm. I did not want to let them down. I have never worried about disappointing those who expected no good out of me. But I've been very worried about disappointing those who expect some good out of me. So I feel that if we validated good, we would be able to undermine the bad. And um, as you may have picked up, I'm an HR practitioner by background, and I'm sitting in an interview one time, and we are interviewing this lady, and we're asking her to tell us, to tell us about her, her weaknesses. And, and, and she comes, I mean, it's a question that's been asked many times. It's a question that I've heard answered many times before. But this particular answer stayed with me. And, and it's the only answer really I remember to the question to this day. And this lady says, I'm, I'm going to struggle with that. And I'm going to struggle with that because I don't focus on my weaknesses. What was the question? Her weaknesses. What are your weaknesses? She says, I'm going to struggle with that. And I'm going to struggle with it because I deliberately don't focus on my weaknesses. I focus on my strengths. Because it is through my strengths that I'm going to be able to compensate for my weaknesses. Now, and, and, and I raise this because it says to me, um, if we were to really speak about what it is that, we, what good we expect from men, identify men that are an embodiment of what we expect from good men and profile that, make that sufficiently prominent, refer to that as many times as possible, then I think there will be more people that want to emulate that. So I'm not sure if I have. <laughs> Absolutely. And then my, my last question is that um, you, you, know, you know you speak very proudly of the fact that you have two daughters, which you know that's a very beautiful thing. Um, in your perfect world, what would you envision for them, or what would you want? To, what type of society would you create for them, especially with the society that we are existing in, and you see what is happening with all sorts of violence towards women. In your view, what would be the perfect type of world for them? Sure. There's, there's, there's possibly two approaches, if I just think of that off the cuff. There's probably two approaches that I'll take to a question like that. Um, the first part is what world would I want them to create for themselves uh, in the first instance, because at least they can control that. And then the second part is going to be what world would I wish for them? In the first instance, in the world that I would wish they'd create for themselves, I would wish that they would create a world where they are with, who, with people they choose to be with than people they have to be with. And the one way to ensure that they are with people they choose to be with than people that they have to be with is by making sure that they are independent, is making sure that they are self-sufficient is making sure that they're able to provide for themselves, is making sure that they have the life skills, the knowledge that is going to ensure that they never have to depend on anyone so that they can then be able to create collaborative relationships rather than relationships of dependency. Because with dependency comes a, a, a cost mm -hmm. of having to give up mm -hmm. some of your agency over your own self. Uh, people who are employed, give up a lot of their agency, no matter what salary they get. And I mean, for all I care, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you could be a CEO of a company. Yeah. You have given up some agency by the fact that you are employed. 
Uh, so, 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 so that's the world I would want them to create for themselves because I will not get treated the way the next person is going to be treated in the, even in the same world because the world I've created for myself excludes me from being treated the way that everybody else gets treated. So I think what will matter more is for them to understand that they have a responsibility to create a world for themselves that's going to treat them as they want to be treated. And that is going to then ensure that on occasions where they, the world that they find does not treat them the way they expect to be treated, they have sufficient agency to be able to intervene and do something about it and call it out. And, and, and thirdly, you are then in a far better position to attract that which coincides with what you, ex you expect when you have set up exactly who you want to be. But it's a difficult space. It's a difficult space. Yeah. I'd, 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 have, I'd, have, I'd have one for you, Sato. Sure. Uh, I know I picked up Gaskatu Kuluma, or I cannot remember what, he, what question exactly, or EP topic, when, when you talked about this, but I'll just ask it uh, uh, independently if, 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 sure. if yeah. Um, it's something that we talked about with uh, the ladies, uh, no please, earlier. Uguti, we rely on media to be um, the mirror of what is happening around us, but also uh, and the quality of, um, of media, the credibility is quite good, right? I, I believe that uh, you, you, you share that uh, belief. Now, if uh, the credibility and, 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 and the quality of, of journalism, of media in general, you are okay with it. Uh, do you believe then, Uguti, what they are telling us is, is the true reflection of what is really happening in government and in the society in, 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 in general? Aukabang Uguti media is a, is operates in a business space as well. So they, they operate in Kulendo Yoguti, what is newsworthy. And so sometimes the airtime is a factor there to say, we'll rather tell you about this corruption scandal instead of telling you about this uh, woman or this guy who did something good and pagatin and stuff like that. So we are in all early media, yeah, the, the nature of, of space about politics or now, or you really believe that no, they have enough and what we really see, when I talk about media, I'm not only talking about radio and TV, your mainstream, but I'm also talking about your, your social media and everything that, you know, local uh, radio, radios, uh, these small YouTube uh, people who are doing their things, these small podcasts that are growing and everything that they are telling us about the society. How, is it, how do you take it? Is, it? is it really, really what is happening there? Or you think... Uh, whatever you think. Sure. Okay. A, a couple of disclaimers first. Yes. I, 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 I have not accepted, and I have not made up my mind yes. about this. Yes. But I let me put it this way: I, I have dealt with a question in my own mind that says, is the media a reflection of the society in which it operates, or is the society a reflection of? the media uh, that influences its thinking. I've, I've struggled with that. Yeah. Um, is the media a function of a society or is the society a function of the media? I have struggled with Who's that. mirroring who? Who's yeah. mirroring who, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> and, and who's fully who? Absolutely. Absolutely. Who's the man? Who's the doer? Yeah. 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 Um, I've, I've struggled with who is setting the agenda and who is the agenda. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I'll give you an, an, a recent experience, and, yeah. and, and I was quite irked by this. You may have even come across some of my uh, venting about it. Yes. Um, I, I struggled a little bit with the idea of vaccinate or do not vaccinate. I, I struggled. And I struggled with it from a very objective point of view, I would like to believe. Uh -huh. It was from a point of view that says, I would like to know a little bit more. I would like to understand 
change a little bit more and I would like to know what is known I would like to know what is not known yeah. uh, and I would like to know what are the implications of that which is known versus the implications of that which is unknown yeah. so I was quite a neutral uh, information seeker here yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, I, I did my best to find the information that I could and made myself available to listen to media yes. that was discussing this issue and that's, there was this one particular day that absolutely disturbed me yes. I'm listening to my then favorite radio station yeah. and uh, everybody that seemed to have questions yeah. uh, around vaccination was gagged almost yeah. um, and, and people were asking questions yeah. and if anyone was expressing any doubt was shut down almost mm -hmm. and people that were for vaccination were getting all the airtime, getting all the validation, getting all the support as if they are the ones that should be calling and not the others. Now, I'm not, I'm not positional about this, but I get irked by this because I then say, what information am I getting here? Is my warming up to this vaccination something that has been choreographed and, and influenced uh, through manipulation or is it based on objective assessment of facts if I'm not being allowed the access to facts? Mm -hmm. So I'm suspicious about the media. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm suspicious not because of anything unusual. Yes. The, uh, we live a life that is influenced by interests. Yes, we, yes. we live a life that is influenced by interests. Um, shareholder value mm -hmm. is top shelf in the thinking of any commercial radio station. Um, funders and sponsors and, uh, and, and advertisers are top of mind in, uh, in the mind of any uh, even community radio station that must survive. So I, I prefer that we triangulate what we hear. I would like to hear what CNN has to say, but I'm not going to ignore Fox, I'm not going to ignore Al Jazeera, I'm not going to ignore Russia TV, yes. just so that I triangulate what I'm saying and what I'm hearing and then make up my mind. And what do you say about the revo revolutionary or the transformation around how, uh, how the access to information uh, happens now, to say we, 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 we in today's um, you know, life. You don't only uh, rely on um, on SABC one, two, three, and ETV, and then on Saturdays you'd have, or in the in the evenings or the afternoon you'd have Mnet. Now you have this long list of 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 of, of uh, channels on DSTV, which most of our people now have access to. But uh, that is not the most revolutionary part that um, uh, we have now in terms of e transformation in the media space social media now you have people who who just set up a facebook uh, account a facebook page and then they'll provide uh, information on yeah on 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 current affairs or you know they will do their research credible uh, graduates or credible uh, yeah people around um, whatever space and then uh, we, we can make we can mention number of uh, platforms on on twitter or platforms on Facebook page, including the, the, the Royal Express that we see on Jenga Manju. You know, those you also have those platforms who are more independent, which are less restricted by by the if you for example SABC is likely to support the agenda of the government, you know. So, so what, what do you think of what do you say about the availability of such alternatives? Or you find the same Nagloma alternatives? I think the fact that those alternatives are emerging is, is, is a good thing. Uh, I do not know if it solves the problem that worries us. Um, I actually find it uh, uh, more dangerous than helpful sometimes. Because once I've got this instrument in my hands, I become a street journalist with no answerability, no accountability uh, that is not co controlled by any form of ethics, mm -hmm. which then allows that any form of the agenda can be peddled mm -hmm. and, 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 and be placed in the public mm -hmm. domain without too much of, a, of the accountability. And, and, and in a society that doesn't have sufficient sophistication to be able to test yes. what we are hearing, yes. um, 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 uh, we, we, that, that can be actually more dangerous yes. than, than it is good. Yes. But what it also does, it provides, an, it provides opportunity that we can triangulate the information that we receive, yes. that we can reference, we can check, we can look at number of sources and be able to make up our minds. Yes. But that assumes yes. that we have sufficient education 
education and sophistication mm -hmm. to be able to do that with any measure of success. L yeah. Last one, last one, uh, Nosipo. Um, um, you spoke about uh, living life of, of purpose, you know, uh, being impactful and is the area of life that I, I enjoy to explore and to integrate Namji on my time. But do you sometimes feel that you are not making impact and how do you address that? So here, Ikampa Netizen invites you to give a workshop on, on, on work ethics because they have an issue with Abasebe and Zabanga behaving, get the right. And then they give you money to do that exercise and you put your time, your passion and your spirit into it and then you do it. And then three years later, as you said, that you'd always have those reflection uh, with the company and then they tell you that, ah, it's still the same. How, how do you how do you feel, and if that happens to you, and if it happens, and how do you address Leo Ido, Leo Shampe, that I would think it, it may just drag you down and feel like, yeah, I'm just doing this because I get money and the tip box thing is it's, it's not really about impacting these people. Yeah. If, if, how do you deal with that? Yeah. I've, I've developed a, a a a a preference for private sector organizations, uh, preferably ones that also have an entrepreneur on site. Uh, I've worked for Parastatals and I've known what it is to be in an organization that belongs to nobody, uh, where decisions are made for the sake of entertaining your management, entertaining my egos, entertaining things without any real commitment to purpose. Mm -hmm. And when you work with private sector uh, entities, particularly those that are owner-run, owner-managed, you start finding that whenever you say you're proposing a, a performance management system uh, or performance management training. He wants to get a benefit of his managers being able to manage a performance because it must translate to improvement in the bottom line. Mm -hmm. When you say to him, Oguti, what you need is to engage your unions uh, in a relationship building and uh, uh, intervention and agree on a relationship charter that's going to regulate how you manage your relationship with your unions. He wants that not just to tick the box and say I did it. He wants that because he wants to spend less time in strife and confrontation with the union and spend more time creating having conversations about how we can make this business do better so I've developed a, 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 a preference for those types of businesses but there are there are amazing managing directors of parastatals there are amazing um, CEOs of uh, uh, um, public organizations that do want to see a my outcomes but when I have battled to see why you engaged this process it seems like you engaged in this process to tick the box um, my, my satisfaction doesn't come from what you've paid my invoice my satisfaction comes from what I can say I did this when so-and-so was experiencing this problem look at them now we got I got involved when so-and-so was having a similar problem and look at them now that's what grows my business. I don't grow from spending a payment from, the, from a single invoice. I grow from a reference of results I achieved through a previous assignment. So I, I try to steer clear of those that are just trying to tick their boxes and complete KPI. In terms of like, if you look at the leaders in today's world from like your communist and your dem uh, democratic um, if you look at how they've branded their countries through their leadership, if you were like the leader of, let's say, South Africa, um, taking away Vladimir Putin, what he's done with Russia, taking, just seeing what Xi Jinping has done with China, when well, if you had that position as a leader, what would your key focuses be on? And how, do you, how would you get the people to understand your vision? Um, in a different, unique way. But what would your key focuses be on based on the current situation in the country that we are in? Okay, cool. Um, I don't believe for a moment that e South Africa is sitting in a position now where we have a luxury of being democratic. We're in crisis, and the best leadership style in a crisis is autocracy. Uh, I do have a qualifier though to that autocracy. It has to be a benevolent autocracy. An autocracy that says I'm looking out for your interest. I almost want to to say it's akin to a parent that is going to say to a child no to this. 
You may not have the understanding of why I'm saying no, but it is benevolent no it is in your interest so if i sat in a position i would only accept or to a leadership of a country like south africa today if i was going to have a period of three to five years where i can be autocratic benevolently autocratic i i just don't believe that we have we have the luxury of being democratic at this stage if we are to pull ourselves off the quandary that we are in um i don't believe that people who have no 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 accountability for the outcomes should have any say any authority on what actions are taken and i think our system has allowed a lot of people who have no accountability at all to have a lot of authority and then the second question this is based on expected youth allowed the eye um so as you know i am product of being an exchange volunteer and seeing what that has done for me and you had you had preached the whole being a globalist like go out there and experience sure um also with you being in germany yourself you being the first you know leading the way what do you see or how, how would you encourage the people within the expected youth to go about there and contribute themselves and be the x but in an international scale where do you see that going and what more would you like to, but like, what else would you want to do in that space, in the volunteer exchange realm, not only in Europe, but in like the Americas and the Asias? What do you see um, through the expected youth in particular? Sure. Look, there are a couple of conversations that have allowed that the world is able to share common problems. And there are a couple of platforms in modern world that should enable collaboration from uh, across different um, um, jurisdictions. Um, I am a big believer that the sustainable development goals have been able to summarize the world's agenda. If we were to take those uh, um, um, SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, as the current world agenda for the next 5, 10, 20 years, and then be able to say that uh, Global South, which of these are key priorities out of these 16 uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and then be able to say um, who else is having programs that are aimed at addressing the same issues and then we collaborate whether we collaborate virtually as we are able to do and then create opportunities for conduct uh, and seeing what i mean take an establishment like ours here uh, in an establishment like ours there surely is another establishment sitting somewhere else that is dealing with some of the ecotourism challenges that i'm experiencing one of my biggest challenges in this area particularly when it comes to my hikes as you probably will have experienced or will when you take your hike is is pollution is 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 waste management and and it has such an impact uh, part of our challenges is going to be your alien vegetation and species and, and those problems are ju not just unique here. And you may find that there are people who are four, five, six years ahead of dealing with those challenges. And if we could have global cooperations, whether through virtual platforms, through reading, through uh, perusing our research papers of other people, and then finding those people and being part of networks like that, you will start to find that you start to build networks around a common interest. And as you start to build networks around a common interest, you start creating visitation opportunities. And as you get to have those visitation opportunities you get exposed to the be best practice of the different areas and and you host people who are also going to import um, 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 some of the best practices that come from their uh, um, home countries and then we're able to build the collaborations and build partnerships on, on a global scale but yeah indeed I'm a big proponent of being a global citizen I used to call them uh, internationalists that they should never see themselves as South Africans they should see themselves as internationalists uh, and 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 yeah, he's champion to that 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 with a block. I gotta get yeah. that sound right. Okay, <laughs> 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 yes. looking at the employment and the privileges and the benefits you had during your generation, and looking at my generation, clearly there's a huge difference in terms of employment opportunities. And these days, I mean, we can all agree we're all we're all looking at the entrepreneurship route because of circumstances not because of, you know, we want to, but it's because we have to, because there's no other way. Um, so if you were to compare the generations on your side, what, what, would, what are the key things that we should focus on based on what you've seen and what you've experienced in your time? 
and how do you suggest we maneuver through this whole thing of life with unemployment and entrepreneurship? It's completely two different worlds, I think. Um, when, when, when I grew up, I was almost assured that if I had a metric plus a three-year qualification, I would be in a fairly comfortable job. Um, within a few years thereafter, it started being a metric, a, a postgraduate qualification preferably, and, and, and cumulatively it started. And today, um, you have an opportunity as long as you've got a, 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 a differentiator, a, a, a solution. You're living in a very solution-driven world. So it's completely different set, skill sets. Um, what I would take from my generation, perhaps, is, is the determination to succeed. Um, but I would definitely say that the key thing, my generation didn't have it, your generation has a chance to have it, is just be available to opportunities. Look at what is going on, figure out what advantage can you take of what is going on, what skill set is going to be required. You've got access that my generation never had. I could learn just about anything. Uh, if I decided today that I want to start baking wedding cakes, uh, I have access to all the content, the videos, the recipes, just at my fingertips. And, and it's just a question of being available for opportunities. I do personally think that this generation sit with far more opportunities than my generation did. And your generations are not limited to geographies. They are global, um, and, and, and which means that the entire globe is your market. If you've got a solution, and that solution makes sense to a number of territories, there's no stopping you. It's just a mindset that says be open to opportunities. Um, so I just want for this question for you to speak to me as, as, a, as a child, you know, as a daughter. What would your advice be to me um, to travel overseas? Because my biggest fear is that, you know, if I go overseas, maybe I might not want to come back or, you know, maybe a higher, they, 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 they wouldn't understand. So what I want to do overseas and everything, what would your advice be to me? Travel. Travel. So what if you don't want to come back? Mm. So why do people want to travel? I mean, the world is a neighborhood today. The world today is a neighborhood. Yeah. The fact that we are sitting some 12,000 miles away from South Africa, it's exactly there, just 12,000 miles, one flight away, yeah. uh, one day's flight away. Yeah. So, so what if you are a neighbor that's sitting in Portugal, if you are a neighbor that is sitting in, in Perth, uh, so what if you don't want to come back? If you can establish yourself a life anywhere else in the globe, that, that, that's a neighborhood. You are not in some other planet. That's a neighborhood. Um, if, 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 if Virgin Galactic and Elon Musk have their way, even, even these planets um, uh, will be neighborhoods too. So I, I don't know. I would always encourage that people leave the comfort of the familiar and we discover so much more of our own potential when we have moved away from our comfort zone. Whether or not you decide to come back is not of much significance for me. Uh, if you can amass enough resources to be able to come home whenever you need to come home, and if those who care about visiting you are able to put the resources necessary to come and see you, all good. But life is life. Uh, uh, you can either live life as you've always known it, or you can live life as you want to live it. And I would always support that you live life as you want to live it. Yeah, I think we're reaching the end of the recording of our podcast. The blessings from the rain that is falling right now, cascading on our souls. So much knowledge, so much growth, so much revelation, and uh, some life-changing decisions that I believe have been inspired uh, by the discussion that you have so blessed us to have with you today. I uh, give my appreciation and my wonderful thanks to you um, for having opened your heart and your home uh, to the library of knowledge that you have. Thank you so much, Thank Sir you. Dog. Thanks for making it, thanks for exposing us to these things and who knows where, they will, where we will take them to now that we've been introduced and know that they can be used as a platform.
So why write a book if you can have a conversation with the next generation? No, no, we still have to write a book. We still, we still need to go and do it. I'm for traditional future. Let's do both. Let's do both. Let's do both. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nosipa. Thanks, Akumada. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this is the Royale Express podcast. Make sure to subscribe, follow, and like. Thank you for joining me.